Um, oh, okay. Today's webinar is eligible for one contact hour. Sigma Theta Tau International Honor Society of Nursing is accredited as a provider of nursing continuing professional development by the American Nurses Credentialing Center's Commission on Accreditation. The speakers and planning committee members have disclosed no conflicts of interest. To receive contact hours for this CPD session, participants are required to attend the webinar and complete the evaluation form, which will be emailed to all attendees approximately one week after the webinar. This webinar is being recorded and will be available via the Sigma repository within a few business days of recording. Following the presentations, we will have time for a question and answer session. You'll see on your GoToWebinar control panel that you can send a message through the questions feature. This is where you can type any question that you have for the presenters. Please make sure you hit send so the message makes it to us. We would like to thank our speakers today for sharing their expertise with us. Our speakers are Tim Cunningham, Dory Fontaine, and Natalie May. Tim began his professional career as a clown and actor. It was work with the Big Apple Circus Clown Care that inspired him to study nursing, resilience, human agility, and compassion. He currently serves at, as a Vice President of Practice and Innovation at Emory Healthcare. Dory Fontaine is the Dean Emerita at the University of Virginia School of Nursing, retiring in 2020. Founder of UVA's Compassionate Care Initiative, Dory has four decades of experience as a critical care nurse and trauma nurse and a distinguished record of leadership at the national or the nation's top nursing schools, including University of Maryland, Georgetown University, and University of California, San Francisco. Natalie holds joint appointments in the UVA Schools of Nursing and Medicine, where she has taught and conducted research on clinical and learner well being for nearly two decades. She was a co investigator in the Templeton funded Wisdom in Medicine study, and she is currently a lead investigator in a study of mattering among health professionals in nursing and medical students. Welcome speakers, take it away, Tim. Thank you so much uh, for those introductions and, and thank you everyone for joining this webinar today, whether you're joining us live or if you, if you catch this recording down the road. Um, I'm really grateful that you've taken some time out to, to listen to some ideas that we have to share and then those of you that are here live to ask some questions at the end. Um, we, we have been planning, Natalie, Dory, and I, oh gosh, we've been, well, we've been working together for almost three years now, um, looking closely at self-care, what it means, what it is, what it was, what it might become, what it might be turning into. Um, and it's been a joy, Dory and Nat Natalie, to be able to work with you all so closely and with all these changes. I mean, when we started uh, the project with, with our book, Self-Care for New and Student Nurses, we had no idea a pandemic was right around the corner. And so as we were putting this webinar together to talk about self-care and well-being, we decided at kind of the last minute to change our presentation order a little bit to first talk about something really critically important, and that is acknowledgement. And that is acknowledgement of all of you on this webinar today that are working clinically, that are leading clinical teams, that are somehow clinically connected or instructors or teachers supporting people who are on the front lines. Um, I would argue that healthcare in this country has never seen a crisis to this level, perhaps ever, if not for the last 100 years. And as we talk about self-care and well-being today, and I can tell you from my own experience, having worked as an emergency trauma nurse, um, having worked in humanitarian settings like the West Africa e Ebola outbreak, having worked in post-earthquake Haiti in 2010, and, and thinking a lot about our, our neighbors in Haiti right now going through the most recent earth, earthquake in Okai, um, it's really challenging sometimes to be on the front lines and then have folks like us come and talk about what you should do to practice self-care or what you should do to practice resilience and well-being. 
Because many of you know, sometimes by the time it's written and published on the page, it's already a little out of date. And I want to acknowledge that we are kind of separated from the front lines. It's been a while since we've been there. In my current role as Vice President of Practice, uh, of Practice and Innovation at Emory Healthcare, one of my roles is to spend times on the front, time on the front lines with our frontline nurses, our technicians, our phlebotomists, our security crews, our front desk staff, our valets, people that are interacting every day with people suffering and dying from COVID. And, and I know firsthand from hearing those stories that our teams are suffering profoundly. And I want to acknowledge the suffering that you all are experiencing and your teams are experiencing. A key element to self-care begins first and foremost with acknowledgement and authentic acknowledgement. And the great stuff that Natalie and Dory are gonna share later today is it comes, it's evidence-based, it's evidence informs. it comes from years and lifetimes of work and practice and study. And, 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 and it's got a lot of great teeth that way. And at the same time, we recognize that things are changing, sands are shifting. And that the suffering that you all are experiencing right now, we can't really comprehend because we're not there where you are. But where you are is exactly where you need to be. There was a recent article published in The Atlantic, perhaps some of you have read it, talked about a growing concern for compassion fatigue amongst frontline caregivers. And I, I, and I can tell you from my experience at Emory right now, at, in this moment, our IC, ICUs are beyond capacity. Our emergency departments are full every day. The waiting rooms are, are chocked full. Our teams are exhausted. And something that I'm learning both from our nurses here in this health system where I work, as well as nurses nationally and from this article in the Atlantic, it's being increasingly harder and harder to give compassionate care to someone who comes into one of our hospitals who's not been vaccinated or perhaps someone who's come into our hospitals with COVID who was not wearing masks or was not practicing social distancing. And many of our teammates are really struggling to walk into those patients' rooms and give them the same amount of compassion that they would give to another patient who's in for a heart attack or a patient who's in for a stroke or a patient who maybe was vaccinated and is still sick or someone who maybe for whatever circumstance brought them to the hospital, it's hard for our teammates to have that same level of compassion. And from that is coming a lot of anger. From that is coming a lot of distrust. And many of you know from that is coming a mass exodus of nurses, of technicians, of security staff, of valets, of front desk staff, of environmental service workers, of people leaving these amazing, caring, compassionate professions because it's just too much. So I wanna open this conversation just saying we see you, we hear you, we're with you, and we wanna do our very best to support you with the ideas that we share today, also recognizing that your suffering is so profoundly relevant and is something that we will be working with you and our teams for probably the rest of our professional careers in, in working through how do we build post-traumatic growth and how do we over time bounce back from what we've gone through. I wanna close with a quote and, and then uh, I'll turn it over to my co colleagues to share their slides um, in, in this conversation today. It's a quote that I wanna share. Um, it's from James Baldwin. This is his book that I'm taking it from right here. It's called uh, The Fire Next Time. And I love these words and I often share these words with our nurse residents um, and, and our, our sort of new grad nurses and, and other nurses new to the profession. But Baldwin, in the beginning of his book, he writes these words, take no one's word for anything, including mine, but trust your experience. Know whence you came. If you know whence you came, there is really no limit to where you can go. I'm gonna read that one more time. James Baldwin writes, take no one's word for anything, including mine, but trust your experience. Know whence you came. If you know whence you came, there is really no limit to where you can go. And I'd ask everyone on this webinar to trust your own lived authentic experience because from that place of your authentic experience comes a place of self-care, of understanding your own personal and team self-care needs to build resilience, which over time will support compassion no matter what comes our way as nurses. 
So with that, I will pause and I will hand this over to uh, my co-author and colleague and friend, Natalie May. Mm -hmm. Good morning. <clears throat> Hi, everybody. Um, I thank you, Tim, uh, for setting us off that way. Um, and thanks to everybody who's joined us. Uh, I'm just going to, I'm actually going to digress already before my first slide. Um, and it's really just sort of a collective self care uh, bonus. And I think it uh, dovetails nicely on what Tim said because um, getting through this is going to take some collective. Uh, community. And I've been fascinated by the Zoom wave, right, that we all do at the end of a Zoom call. And I did a little research on it this week, and it turns out we are overperforming social cues. That's what psychologists say we're doing. Um, and it's because we want to be friendly. We want to stay connected to people that we're so far away from. Okay, well, that's really cool, right? Um, but on Monday, a colleague and I were standing in front of an auditorium of uh, nursing faculty. And at the end of our presentation, I did the Zoom wave and people waved back, like the entire auditorium, people were doing the Zoom wave. Um, so I don't know why that amuses me so much, but um, I think it's a, some sort of testament to our need to be connected and how important that is. Um, so I want to make sure that I can move my slides, folks. Um, um, and Natalie, could you just yeah. use the arrow buttons? Does that work for you? That's the problem is that I'm not seeing any arrow buttons. No, your just your arrow keys. Oh, can those arrow buttons. Yeah, there you oh. go. Yay, thank you. Okay, I'm good at some things, but not always technology. Thank you. Hey, it's all right. Uh, no problem. <laughs> okay. Um, so I'm going to talk to you today about super, self care superpowers. And this is a, a weird name, but we wrote this book, right? And, you know, during the middle of COVID, and it became this labor of love. But the goal was to find the best information, the things that would be most helpful and most relevant. And in putting together all these chapters by all these experts, um, both on nursing and on self-care and resilience, there were definitely these themes that went through all the chapters in some way, shape, or form. People may have used different language, um, but there was some magic threads that went through everything. So we distilled those down into something that I'm calling superpowers. Um, but there's about 10 or 12 um, this morning. I only have time to talk about three. Although if I do digress, I might mention a couple of the others. Um, so the, the core of all of these things is the science of brain neuroplasticity, this ability of our brains to form new neural pathways. So if you, so I'm looking outside my window right now and I see my front porch and I see our mailbox. And for years, my husband and I would walk from the front porch to the mailbox and eventually it wore down this path. And at some point we said, oh my God, that is so ugly. We have this worn down path right in the middle of our beautiful lawn. Um, so we made a very intentional effort to walk along the side of the driveway where nobody would see it. And sure enough, over time, the grass regrew in that pathway and a new path formed. So that, in a nutshell, is brain neuroplasticity. And it is formed by the wiring happens based on your experiences. So think about this, if every time, and, and let me just, mention right now, I use a lot of examples that don't have anything to do with nursing um, because these are all practices that you need to practice all the time. If you're standing in line at the grocery store, if you are, you know, obviously at work managing, caring for patients, um, but also in your personal life, it's just, it is literally a practice that needs to be done over and over and over again to make this brain neuroplasticity work. So honestly, I love the examples from day to day, everyday life, um, but I encourage you to start thinking about ways to use them um, in your work life, ways that, pra ways that practice can work for you. 
Um, so for example, my husband used to always leave the bedroom closet door open. And so if that's the, if that's the thing that I'm responding to, and I always respond in a negative way, like, oh my God, my husband is so annoying. Why does he always leave the closet door open? That's the pathway that's going to form in my brain, a very negative pathway that then sparks other negative things. Um, you know, annoyance with my husband, unkind words to him, um, distance between us and our relationship, right? But if I rewire, if I start intentionally responding differently, I see the closet door closed and I just take a breath and I close the door and I remind myself how busy he is and what a rush it is for him to get out of the house in the morning. Suddenly, all those things that were negative um, can eventually get rewired. And I can tell you, and my husband can tell you uh, that it works. Um, so we all know that trauma and negative thinking affect our brain in a negative way. And this is the neuroplasticity piece. Um, and obviously this is all feeds into resilience. Um, and I will add right now that, you know, a long time ago when we first started uh, studying resilience, people thought it was some magic ingredient. Um, and Ann Mastin, actually a nurse researcher, um, went and looked at like two decades of uh, resilience research and said, wait a minute, this is not um, some magic ingredient. And she said it's really, she, she called it ordinary magic. It's something that we all have. We all have this ability to rewire our brain um, for resilience. Um, Rick Hansen, if you are interested at all, uh, in the science of brain neuroplasticity, or certainly on resilience, I encourage you to read anything by Rick Hansen, but uh, his book on resilience is especially good. And he says, as you internalize experiences of well being, that builds inner strengths, which in turn make you more resilient. Well being and resilience promote each other in an upward spiral. Okay, so the first superpower is the power to pay attention. And that's it. Um, it's like Dorothy and the Ruby Slippers. We have this. Um, it takes no extra time, takes no extra money, doesn't use any calories, or it doesn't give you any extra calories, uh, doesn't cost money. You don't have to go to a gym. All we need to do is pay attention. Um, and there's a lot of ways that we can talk about this. Um, but the one that I think is most um, has been most powerful for me, frankly, in the last couple of years is a physical check-in. Uh, I used to come home from work and every night I would have this incredible pain across the back of my shoulders and my lower neck, like to the point where I would, you know, beg my daughter, you know, I'll, I'll, you know, cook your favorite meal tonight for dinner if you'll give me a neck massage. I mean, it was excruciating. Um, and in the course of doing this research and writing this book, um, I started practicing the physical check-in and I noticed that all the time, every time I would check in with myself, my shoulders were up to my ears. Um, and so now I check in regularly and relax. Um, and it's changed everything. Um, neuroscientist Jill Bolt-Taylor, um, if you've had a chance to read her book, um, My My Stroke of Insight, um, she says that if you're trying to sleep at night, if you're having trouble, check to see if your face is scrunched. <laughs> um, and if your face is scrunched, relax it. And almost always that will help you fall asleep. Um, an emotional check-in. Um, how am I feeling? Um, is this patient like triggering in something in me? Am I annoyed? Um, if I'm annoyed, why am I annoyed? If I'm irritated, if I'm anxious? Um, so the trick is always to ask why. Um, you know, I could go into my husband's bedroom closet door, <laughs> but but I won't. But a lot of that, a lot of that process is curiosity, um, which, by the way, is a superpower. Um, and I think my my next story, um, all kinds of um, aches, pains, irritations. We can't fix them if we don't know they exist, and we can't know they exist unless we check in with ourselves and pay attention. Um, and the cool thing about paying attention, this practice of checking in with yourself 
pulls you into the moment. Um, if we were in a room together, I would ask you, why is a road trip so much better for your soul than your commute to work? And the answer, and people usually figure this out, is that a road trip or walking on the beach or visiting a new city forces you to pay attention. Um, you know, you can't go hiking in the mountains um, without paying attention, right? Or you could fall off the trail or, you know, run into a bear, mama bear. Um, you know, so we, we pay attention when we're in new settings. And that leads me to superpower number two, which is the power to be present. Um, you know, we've heard this from um, spiritual practices, psychologists for, for centuries, millennia, um, but it is really important. Um, this is one of my favorite studies of all times. Um, about 10 years ago, Killingsworth and Gilbert um, gave iPhones to 2,250 adults. And at random times during the day, they would ping them and ask three questions. What are you doing? How happy are you on a scale of one, zero to 100? And is your mind wandering? Um, and they found out that it didn't matter what you were doing. What mattered is whether you were being present, whether your mind was focused on what you were doing. Um, and, the, and so the determination of your happiness was your focus. Um, so somebody who was washing dishes <laughs> uh, or doing any chores would be happier than somebody in a five-star restaurant if they were present and paying attention. Um, and so they found, you know, through science, something that we probably already knew, which is that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. So again, this is a practice that you can do while you're waiting for the elevator. This is a practice that you can do while you're walking to your car. Um, it's it's just such a powerful tool, and it and it synergizes with the first superpower of checking in with yourself and paying attention. Um, I love this photograph. I think that everyone in this picture is having is having fun. They do look joyful, right? Um, but I love the woman in front. Um, she is definitely present um, and in the moment. And for any of um, Ted Lasso fans out in the audience, I uh, share this with you, uh, Ted Lasso-ism. Remember to focus on the here and now, and I wish I could do his accent. I'm sorry, I can't. Uh, living in the moment is a gift. That's why they call it a present, y'all. Okay, and the last superpower that I'll share with you this morning is the power to reframe. Uh, the fancy word for reframing is cognitive reappraisal. Um, it's something that I've learned recently that peer support programs use. It's one of the tools uh, that they train peer supporters in. Um, it's helping people see things differently. So it's it comes from this principle that there's a thing of beauty in everything. It depends on how we look at it. Um, so for example, I, you know, here's, an, here's a reframe. Uh, none of my clothes from last, uh, last fall fit anymore. Um, so one way to look at that is, okay, yeah, this is bad. I've, you know, gained the COVID-20. Or it's a wake up call, right? It's, oh my gosh, you really need to get back into, you know, a self-care routine. Um, or it's an excuse to go shopping. Uh, depends on how you look at it. So we call this the flip. Uh, we talk about this uh, in our work a lot. Um, it's an opportunity uh, to think about what is desired. Um, so say for example, compassion is something that's desired. Uh, patient, you have a patient who's always late. Um, and if you think about that as Oh, this patient doesn't respect our time. This patient isn't taking his care seriously. Um, whatever negative way that you can think about that, that's not what's desired, right? What's desired is compassion and finding a path to helping that patient be well. Um, so a way to flip this is to say, all right, you know, what? It, taking some curiosity uh, to the situation. Um, what is this patient uh, struggling with? What are they facing? 
Um, why? Why are they late? And you may find, in fact, when we do this in groups, we almost always find that when somebody has has actually asked a patient, you know, what's what's the barriers? What's what's going on with you that's you know causing you to be late? It's almost always um, you know a childcare situation or a transportation situation, um, and often the staff can help. Um, figure out ways, problem solve uh, with that particular patient. Um, a lot of times it's changing the language. Uh, and I'm just gonna give you a few examples of that, but um, this is such a true thing that what we focus on, uh, we create more of. Um, so I collect, oh, all right, this, this is a different slide, but um, this, you, some of you may recognize this. This is a Christmas tree topper made from a plastic beer cup, frankly. Um, and my daughter made this when she was three. Uh, and this speaks to that point that there's something of beauty in everything, no matter how you look at it. So every year, my I lovingly take this ornament out of the box. My husband lovingly puts it on the tree. And my daughter, who's now 23, uh, sits on the couch and rolls her eyes at us and always says something along the lines of, why don't you go to Target and buy like a real Christmas tree ornament? We're looking at this ornament, which I acknowledge is not very attractive. Um, she looks at this ornament with, you know, just not with the eyes of love that her parents are looking at it with. Um, so uh, just to my point about language, I collect these. I collect examples of language. Um, you know, we do it in healthcare, right? Instead of saying a diabetic now, we say a patient with diabetes. Um, instead of saying non-compliant, we, you know, say a patient who chooses not to or declines to or is non-inherent even. There's just a lot of language out there um, around this. But these are some I've collected over the last few months. Um, instead of saying social distancing or senior woman as a AARP member um, or someone who is single, uh, we say we can say exiled for the good of the realm queen agers or independently owned and operated. And, you know, for better or for worse, you can see some of the differences that those languages, that choice of language evokes. Um, so I'm going to end with my favorite video, an example of reframing. And I'm handing it over to Megan, who can do the magic on this. Um, so that's uh, just a great example. I, I hope you agree. Um, so I just want to thank you. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we'll be taking them later uh, in the question box. Um, and I just I hope that even, even just one or two of these uh, are something that you can practice um, to help you uh, move through the really amazing work that you do. Thank you. And I'm going to hand it over to my dear friend and colleague, uh, Dory Fontaine. Okay, well, thank you so much, Natalie, for those superpowers. I was thinking of my own examples, um, and there's so many. Uh, so I really appreciate your your thoughtful comments. Um, and I also thank Tim because we really don't want to be here preaching about what you should be doing when we know the environment because we're living it with our friends and colleagues um, and the feelings that it um, emerges for all of us. So I thought I would offer you, um, you know, just a few thoughts about another way to think about this topic of work-life balance, which um, everyone 
seems to talk about and very few people seem to be able to achieve. So I'm going to ask Natalie to advance the slides because she is the controller here. So Natalie, can you do next slide? There you go. So I love this slide. Um, it's taken off the web. Uh, a, a nurse running, you know, I was a shock trauma and ICU critical care nurse for many, many years. So I know what an emergency is. And this picture here depicts an emergency. But Pico Iyer, who is a um, wonderful philosopher and travel writer, he wrote a, in a little book, The Art of Stillness. He had this statement in it, the urgency of slowing down. And I think um, everything we're saying really could start with slowing down to reflect. And actually, that's what you're doing by listening to this webinar. Um, your to-do list has 13 things on it, but you thought enough to kind of slow down um, and listen to, to us. And that's what I think we, we really need. Not that you would you know, slow walk somebody having a heart attack or someone who needs to be intubated with COVID. Um, but I wanted to offer some other ways to think about this work-life balance. Uh, next slide. So you know that this is true. Uh, life is often not in neat little boxes. Um, it would be great if you know, we could go to work and then come home and exercise and make dinner. And then a, a lot of you are in school or have been in school and then study and get up the next morning and, you know, start all over again. But, you know, our mind intervenes here and uh, we're often not able to really do that. You've had a tough patient all day and you come home and you're not violating any HIPAA, but you probably feel like you know, getting some support from family or good friends and just say, oh, what a day, you know. Um, and uh, when you're in school, um, again, I'm using the night example, but people are going to school now for advanced degrees, you know, at two o'clock in the morning online. Um, so getting an A on a paper um, that you worked really hard on um, is going to make you feel good the next day at work, even if it doesn't completely relate to say how to how to take a patient off a ventilator. So it's sort of like looking at your life um, in a more synergistic way. Um, work, career, home, family, uh, you know, personal pursuits. When people talk work-life balance, they're often saying, all right, these have to be in perfect balance. Well, there's actually no way. So the next slide is gonna have a picture of a, a woman looking out at the mountains. I um, love the Blue Ridge Mountains and that picture actually reminded me of that. So I'm going to suggest you consider integration, not balance. Um, but there's a ton of literature out there about work-life balance. But there's also more work coming out, including, you know, in uh, the Harvard Business Review about uh, maybe it's time to consider an integrated life so you're not always beating yourself up about uh, trying to have this balance. And I love this quote. I put it at the first, uh, right in the beginning of the chapter on an integrated life. Uh, Mary Oliver's poem from the summer day, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? And just like Natalie spoke about the physical and emotional check-in, that often can make people pause and think, all right, maybe your life isn't wild or maybe it's too wild, but what is your goal? What is the meaningful life that you really are thinking about having? Next slide. So I came upon, I think it might've been even a, a webinar, um, this book, called The Three Marriages from David White. Some of you are familiar with his poetry. Um, he's also an organizational uh, development um, person. But he came up with this concept, and it, it could seem a little odd at first, but it's a metaphor about marriage, not that you have to be married. So his idea is that in order to have a meaningful life, we have to integrate it. 
And the first thing is you have to find a close relationship, maybe with your family of origin. Um, I know some nurses are still living in their parents' basement, <laughs> um, of course. Um, but a close relationship with partner, spouse, or friends, something other than, you know, um, going to work every day. You don't have to be married. Um, second, find a strong, supportive relationship with your work. And this is a two-way street, as I'll talk about with um, how to create a healthy work environment in a minute. But having a supportive relationship with your work and with your colleagues at work um, really will help life be more meaningful. And third, and which is what uh, Natalie and Tim are really talking about, what does it mean to have a compassionate, caring relationship to yourself? And when all those interact, um, we can have what we might say is a more meaningful life, not necessarily a, a balanced one. Um, you know, Anna Quinlan, I have this quote in our book too, um, in her little short guide to a happy life, you can tell I kind of like these short books. There's a lot of things in them, and it gives you time to reflect. This book is um, pretty old now. She said, you can't be first rate at your work if work is all you do. Now, I'm kind of taking a deep breath when I say that because I actually know how nurses are working right now um, and what they're being asked to do. And it might seem that work could be could be all you do. So I'm kind of offering some different ways to think about this. Um, all right, the next slide starts with integrating a life that works with a life that counts. That actually was how I titled the chapter. So what does it mean to have an integrated life? Um, what could some of it look like? Well, the benefits include you know, being your authentic self, you can really be you. And the you that comes to work might be one who gets the assignment and is working really hard with the patients and then also grieving over a family member, perhaps with cancer. You know, it's hard to shake that. Um, I have a, a dear cousin who's on hospice right now. Um, and, you know, it's hard to it's hard to shake that. Um, if you integrate, you have multiple ways to achieve success. Go back to that getting an A in class or um, being thrilled that your kids are back in school um, with mass potentially here. Um, but, you know, there's ways to say, OK, I've, I've been a good parent. I'm a good spouse. Um, and if you have these multiple ways to look at success, they do integrate. And there's data to suggest they can foster well-being, joy, uh, and happiness. So strategies to get there is first of all know yourself, spending some time, whatever whatever you need to, you know, how are you doing? And after a deep breath, what are the things that come up? Um, many people are now doing, you know, yoga, meditation, all sorts of mindfulness activities to really help them uh, look at look at themselves more deeply. Seek support and offer support to others. Um, getting to know your colleagues at work as people. You know, one of the hallmarks of being a nurse, nursing professional is to how do you really get to know your patients? Well, frankly, we need to get to know your coworkers too. So sharing, not oversharing, but sharing things about yourself and asking, being curious about your colleagues um, who are going to have your back. Um, and this can go along with kindness um, and reaching out. And the gratitude literature is, you know, completely over the top, um, saying, you know, three good things in the morning, writing them down, doing it at night, whatever really works um, to spend some time being grateful. And then the next slide talks about... Um, a healthy work environment. Now, I've been talking about healthy work environments through my work with uh, AACN, the Critical Care Association, for over 15 years, probably 16 or 17 years. And I am just amazed how these concepts, these standards for a healthy work environment um, totally uh, can change the way you look at our work settings. 
Um, we spend 100,000 hours at work in our lifetime. Now, just soak that in. Um, that was in the book Awakening Compassion at Work by Worleen and Dutton in 1997. So I calculated mine, and I came up to 95,000 something, and I just retired. But I didn't add in three years as a nursing assistant at Devon Manor outside uh, Philadelphia, because that would probably put me way over 100,000. But I love what I added here was why spend any of this precious time in a place where there's poor staffing, ineffective communication, a manager that maybe doesn't care about you, um, and not a lot of meaningful recognition. And all of those are standards for how to have a healthy, happy work environment. Relationships are key. Um, Tim's chief nurse, Sharon Pappas, in our book, wrote a beautiful essay about, you know, at the end of the day, it is only about relationships that produce the compassion we want across staff, physicians, nurses, respiratory therapy, our housekeepers. And the startling fact, and maybe not so startling, every study shows this as well, um, nurses may leave their manager, but many, at least until the pandemic, are not leaving the profession totally. What they're leaving is what they view as a manager that maybe doesn't support them, doesn't seem to, to know them or care about them. All right, so the last slide then takes me to um, finding a healthy work environment. I love this picture, like piecing the apple together. Um, a healthy work environment to me is a linchpin to creating this whole synergy and integration um, because work affects so much of our life. I could put in there, find a, um, a significant spouse, marriage partner, uh, strong personal relationship. And you know, I, I certainly agree with that too. Um, but I think too many of us are in work environments that are not healthy and um, we could start talking about a healthy work environment and we could think about how to create one. In the book, I talk about how to help new grads and you know early career nurses find a healthy work environment because they really are out there. Um, and you can help in creating one if you're in an environment that's, that's very tough right now. Um, and staffing is an issue nationally, internationally, it's always an issue, but organizations like the AACN are really trying to look at new approaches to that. And I used to tell all my students, I've taught thousands, that at work, they are also part of the team that's sustaining that healthy work environment. And I know this because we did a joy at work um, proposal for the Institute of Healthcare Improvement and people looked at what could we change, one thing we could change. And we surveyed, and it was about stopping emails, believe it or not, what a shock. But one small thing can totally change the environment. And it also shows that you care. So these are my thoughts about an integrated, you know, having an integrated life and considering how everything can synergize each other. Um, and successes in one area can certainly spill over into others. Um, and doing those check-ins um, and acknowledging what the truth right now can really help you think about another way. Next time somebody says work-life balance, think about your own life and what it could mean to have an integrated life. So I'm going to stop there. I'm so grateful for your listening and we have, um, you know, enough time for some questions. So I think we're all going to come back on Tim and Natalie and they're going to kind of go through questions for us. Hi, hi guys. <laughs> Zoom <wave. laughs> I want to thank you all for sharing your information with us today. Um, you know, I was taking notes um, as I am a nurse uh, that works with Sigma. So I wrote down quite a bit of great information from all of you. I do want to say one uh, thing that 
resonated with me as we wait for some questions to come in is the concept of getting to know your people. So this, uh, you know, coincides with what Cy Wakeman has to say with tending to your people first um, and that sort of thing. So I thank you so much for everything you've shared. We do have a question here. Um, about training yourself to remember the tactics. And this came in when Natalie was speaking. So mm -hmm. how do I train myself to remember these tactics? When unhappy or stressed out, it feels like I am emotionally hijacked and I can barely mm -hmm. think. So mm -hmm. we'll open it up to any of you that would like to speak to that. Sure, um, I'll start and <laughs> that I wish I could bottle what you just said because we want to encourage nursing students to start these practices while they're still students, right? That was the original intent of the book because, you know, and I think Kim uses the runway airplane metaphor, right? That, you know, you want to be prepared to take off before you take off. So in an ideal world, you would have had the opportunity to practice these practices before you began your practice. Well, clearly that ship has sailed. Um, so all I can tell you is that it will get easier and that if you practice it in environments that are easier, like, you know, and maybe it's, it's, I don't know what your commute is like, but you're either walking to a parking spot and or driving or riding a bus, whatever, um, environments that are less stress are great times to practice the checking in. Um, if you think to do it in your hectic, stressed work environment, remember that probably the most magical thing that you can do is restorative breathing. Um, you know, so if you check in with yourself, you know, you've left a patient's room, if you can, even moving to the next patient, take deep breaths um, as part of your check-in, that will help. Dory and I disagree on this, but I also think that a glass of water is always very helpful. Oh, a glass um, of water. Yeah, a glass good. of water, Dory doesn't like water, but yeah. it really, uh, sometimes hunger and fatigue can be addressed by a glass of water. Um, <laughs> so all I, can, all I can do, it's a very long answer, but I encourage you to practice it in low stress environments. Um, waiting in line at Trader Joe's is a great place. Um, except they're so darn fast. You don't have to wait very long. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, that's that really does reinforce our argument that nursing students should be uh, given these skills. And I'm apologizing for my annoying cat. Um, I'm going to go pick him up. Tim, Dory, you answer. <laughs> do you want to respond, Tim? Yeah, just briefly, um, I think to add to what Natalie's saying, I fully agree. And also something to remember is that it doesn't have to be perfect. When you're when you are doing what you are trying to do to downregulate, when you're feeling emotionally hijacked, you might not get to, if you're at 100% emotional hijack and you want to be back down to zero, which is sort of your baseline, you might not get all the way back to zero. But sometimes noticing I've gone from 100, taking those few breaths between patients, I'm down at 90. Can you count that as a win? because it's those little changes. We have a, a chapter in our book where we talk about Kaizen practices, K-A-I-Z-E-N. And Kaizen is a Japanese term that basically says little by little, step by step. For example, the last two days I've been working 16 hour days because of our current COVID crisis and just things are mm -hmm. crazy right now. Um, and I have a regular meditation practice that I try to do in the mornings. I didn't have time, I'm exhausted. So instead of a five minute meditation, I literally did a one minute meditation while my coffee heated up. Not ideal every single day, but it was enough. So Kaizen, take those little steps and know that even a little little work towards it is better than no work. Mm -hmm. and, and if you can forgive yourself and have a sense of grace and take those little steps, that can build it and support it over time too. Yeah, and I, I agree with all of this. I think uh, you can practice it you know, at work, but you can also practice it at home. Like Natalie was talking about her husband and I use the pause, you know, take that deep breath and pause before you say that unkind thing or something like, well, why did you do this? Instead of saying, 
to yourself, let me be grateful, grateful for what's going on and kind of reframe. So those are my hints. All right, we do have a question that is a little bit on the fun side. So this participant <laughs> wants to know um, what you, each one of you would say is the most unique, wacky, or fun way to promote your own self-care. Um, and then of course she said, thank you, this has been a fabulous webinar. I'm sure Natalie that yours has to deal with your cat. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> He is not good for my self-care. Um, although, actually, now that you say that, um, so I've been, Tim can relate to this. We're writing two very large HRSA grants. Um, <laughs> and so I'm in my office. And yes, my cat works with me because my husband's on the other side of the door. And so I win the cat. Um, but my 83-year-old neighbor um, moved in with her daughter and left seven stray cats, including four kittens. Um, so I've been feeding them on my porch right outside the door. And I've got a rescue coming to get them, but I really don't want them to come soon because I just love looking at them. Now, that may not be wacky, but the trick about that is it touches on another superpower, which is savoring. So if you are enjoying something, whether it's something wacky, whether it's, um, you know, holding your cat or petting your dog, savor that. That's what causes the rewiring in your brain. You can't just, you know, say, oh, I love my dog. You need to sit with that um, and let it do its magic on your brain circuitry. So I've been being very intentional about watching the kittens on my porch and trying not to get upset about the fact that I have seven strange cats on my board. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so thanks, Linda. Yeah, yeah, it, it was a cat thing. Mm -hmm. Hey, what's yours? Hope that uh, gave you guys time I to come know. up with your own wacky answers. Think, um, <laughs> I don't have cats. We have, we have neighbors with animals. Um, in fact, my whole street um, is full of children and dogs. It seems like everybody has gotten a puppy um, during the pandemic and actually they're growing up now. Um, we didn't get one. You know, I think uh, I think one of the things I like to do in addition to, you know, taking medication, medication, meditation class, maybe it is medication. <laughs> Back to, so meditation classes with a dear colleague through our compassionate care initiative and then um, trying to walk, um, which I love to be outside and walk. And uh, this whole concept of forest bathing. I did do some Tai Chi classes and the teacher often would be out in her backyard and, you know, and it's just there's something about nature. So I kind of um, would say that I, I crave nature. And meanwhile, I have a big giant pile of dirt in my backyard because we're trying to renovate and, and do something. Um, so those are uh, some things that I like to do. I don't think it's too crazy, but I encourage being out in nature for sure. And Tim, Tim's our runner and our clown. I run. I like to I like to move my my body and, and it's been tough since the pandemic because there's just not been time to get out and and I live in a state where even being outdoors without a mask is scary at times we only have a 40 percent vaccination rate in the state of Georgia um, but another thing that I do and I think about Natalie your first slide talking about early slides talking about neuroscience and how our brains like patterns and so much of the practice is changing patterns over time so I create patterns when I'm super stressed out I create <laughs> I knew. I was hoping he would do that. <laughs> Am I still on the screen here? I'm kind of like squatting to stay in the screen. Literally, I physically create these patterns, especially when I get bad news, especially when things are going down with my team, especially when I have to have like a really tough conversation with someone. I will <laughs> jump for a little bit and then let it go. And then that gets my heart rate up and I feel like I'm ready to get back in the game. Um, wow. so, okay, so with that question of plant, Tim, did you did you plant that question? <laughs> I'll Venmo you uh, twenty twenty dollars cash. Thanks for. Uh... <laughs> well, Tim, is only, Tim is the only faculty I ever hired. He worked at the University of Virginia for many years. He's the only faculty I ever hired who did a headstand during his job interview. 
And, you know, then he throws rubber chickens at people, too, which I've saved mine. I, I'm not throwing at anybody because I want to keep it. Um, so I think being lighthearted and laughing uh, in the toughest of times is is what Tim certainly brings to Emory and also brought to University of Virginia. Um, uh, wow, I, I'm just so very thankful for you guys this morning. And so our, our participants, one said, Tim juggling was well worth this webinar. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Oh. Um, I, um, so, oh, so Dory, we need to learn how to do the juggling across Zoom screens. Yeah, exactly. You know, have you seen that where they do that? We, Tim, we'll, yeah. we'll work on that with you. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Linda, didn't mean to interrupt. No, that's okay. I do have one that's a little a question from a participant that is a little bit more serious. Um, what is the best practice re to reframe desensitizing ourselves to success? I found that I'm so focused on striving for optimizing my own efficiencies in a variety of roles. I do not know how to truly have gratitude or pride for the success I experience. It's obviously hard to have this joy spill over in other areas of life when I don't really feel it to begin with. Hmm. Wow. Well, well I, I, Tim, go yeah, ahead. It's only part of an answer to the question and happy to come back as we kind of think about this. Thank you for, for your vulnerability in sharing that. I think that's mm -hmm. really important. And I'd like to first just normalize what you're feeling. Um, I think especially in the time of the pandemic and especially as being a nurse, it's really hard to consistently or even rarely feel that there's time to, to celebrate, time to acknowledge, or to frankly feel good enough. That's something I struggled with when I was working as an emergency nurse full time in adult and pediatric emergency departments. I never felt like I was doing enough. I never felt that I was good enough. So I want to begin by just saying what you're feeling is, is a lot of folks that similarly, um, and so you're not alone. Um, mm -hmm. Natalie, anything more? I, I would just say that um, training yourself to be grateful um, and giving yourself a pause between all these, you know, running to the next, um, writing things down, you know, whether morning or night, if you can write three things that you're grateful for, it might help start training your brain. I've been doing this for a long time and I, I have books now where I'm writing them in and it's kind of nice to go back and look, what were you grateful for, you know, in January? Um, so that's one suggestion. And I'm sure Natalie has some too. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the reason gratitude practices work is that what we focus on grows. So, and, and it's, so that's one piece of my answer. Um, so I agree that, but I also think you could shift what you're noticing. So maybe it's noticing what you've achieved or noticing your successes. So instead of writing down gratitude things, you could try writing down three good things that you accomplished or that you're proud of um, mm. each day. It's I really, I interested, listened to the Happiness Lab podcast and this week it was about, um, getting over rejection, the heartbreak of rejection. Mm -hmm. And it was fascinating because one of the things he said, so if you get rejected by, you know, a romantic partner, um, write down all the things about yourself that make you a great romantic partner. Or if you get rejected for a job, write down all the things that make you a great employee. Um, so I'm still mulling that over in my head. Um, so I, my answer isn't the answer I would give you in a week. Um, maybe two weeks, given the rate of my thinking. Um, <laughs> but I think it's a really wonderful question. Um, and I just encourage you to shift your focus um, to the things that you really um, have mastered and that you're proud of. We talk about positivity portfolios um, and just you could, you could do a success portfolio, something on your phone that you look at that reminds you, um, mm -hmm. things on your desk that um, remind you of things you've accomplished. Um, again, it's just choosing to notice those mm -hmm. things that you need to notice. Yeah. 
oh, I can do this all day. We're done, aren't we? <laughs> Unfortunately, we are coming to a close. I do want to say there are a ton of questions that viewers submitted that we did not get a chance to get to today. So um, can participants reach out to you guys on social media if they feel inclined? Sure. Absolutely. Awesome. Um, Very good. And, and email is, is great for me too, if that's yeah, Email is good for me, I'll, I respond. Awesome. So I want to thank you all for sharing all this wonderful information today. Sigma is grateful that you took the time to share with us and the audience and look forward to hearing more from you in the future. We hope that our participants enjoyed this webinar. As a reminder, one week from today, you will receive an email with a link to the evaluation for you to obtain your continuing professional development certificate. Be sure to check out Sigma's upcoming webinars, podcasts, books, and resources to support you and your colleagues at sigmanursing.org. Also, previously recorded webinars and podcasts are freely available to you on the Sigma repository. Thank you for joining us today and have a wonderful day. It's the Zoom wave. <laughs> Bye, everybody. <laughs>